Well, it, you know, I think that in a way, the, the, the journey that uh, that we've made through all the, through the through the film world has been, um, you know, e e every day you don't you can't predict it. So in a sense, one day you're, you're working on a a project that you pushed and you you've gotten a commission for. The next you know month later, you you get a commission for a commercial. You go with it. It bends you in a direction that you hadn't planned on. on going and then but you're not you, there's no predictable route that we were planning to make so in the sense that uh, and then a theater piece might come in or an opera piece but when, when you're thinking of an opera piece you're also thinking at the same time of, of another film piece or so in a sense the, the journey is not predictable so we thought that the, the maze was uh, I think something suitable to because it is about confusion and our own confusion at times. I think this, the studio abounds in, in this reflective glow that um, has always been preeminent. I mean, in, in, in the sense that the influences that we have are multiplied by being two. So there's two of us to digest and, and you know, expand or, or choose how, how we uh, uh, defend the certain choices that we, we should make. Um, and I, I think also that, uh, that, that the, the two really crucial influences which we've staged was that um, imagine that you're in a, a Fairview Village is in no man's land really for us out way outside Philadelphia, outside Narstown. And there with our art teacher, he introduced us to, he said, I think you should meet one man. And it was Rudolf Freund, the scientific illustrator. So I think in that sense, it was the first time that we had really met an artist of that kind of caliber who set such a high tone for a, you know, something to aim for. And he was just, He'd receive us, you know, with no shirt on. He was a big Hemingway-esque man, um, and we'd just go there, just stop in, and, and spend the whole afternoon with him, um, and then sit with him in his library while he worked on his artwork. But then, it, it, at that point, then you, we we went, we got into the Philadelphia College of Art, and day one we walked in, and there was this fabulous exhibition of, of for us, the heroic. Polish poster of from the 1960s, with which is a collection upstairs, and so there was this other huge diametrically imaginative realm, rather than Ru Rudolf Freud's work was very documentary, uh, specifically uh, scientific illustration, and then there was this other side which bristled with imagery and typography. So there were. Two restraints I think that have been marked us for this journey that we're making, that we're making now, still. Well, I think I think that the, the documentary side is very strong in us, which we we really were. You know, you're attentive to, to you're vigilant and attentive, but at the same time, you can move in in a direction which is purely imaginative and doesn't have any reference to the documentary. So I think it's two poles that we balance and, and, and that one feeds the other very powerfully. I think it came at a moment when we've been tramping up and down to New York City from Philadelphia, trying to get public publication work in doing we want a fiction literature. And they kept slinging a few science fiction things at us, and this all failed. And so, in the end, one of us became a, a waiter at a restaurant, the other one to the Jewish Times, it became a graphic designer. And in the meantime, we did these, these black drawings. And we just slowly, every night, we just worked on these drawings. And, um, but also, but, but what became of them in the end was, for us, was a kind of failed cinema because what they lacked was 
death sound music. And so in, in, in a way, they were the, the next step towards cinema, towards leaving, leaving Philadelphia, going to England, going to Amsterdam, leaving the graphic design world, and going towards the cinema. But you, you have to remember that that was purely an accident. I mean, we, we went, we left, we left Philadelphia to go to England en route to Amsterdam to become illustrators in Amsterdam. By stopping in, in, in London, Keith Griffiths, our producer, said, why don't you propose a script for an experimental film for the BFI, British Film Institute. We did, we left from Amsterdam, stayed six months, he whistled, he said, you got the grant. Then we became filmmakers. But it was our first, I mean, the, the idea was that <clears throat> Keith said, propose an experimental film, and we said, well, we don't do experimental films. And then he said, well, propose something anyway. And then we, and that's when we, because we'd seen a, a few puppet films, and we said, well, we'll do a puppet film. And but it was a sheer bluff, it was sheer bluff. And then he said, that looks good. Write a script, we wrote one in three days, left, went to Amsterdam. You know, and then, as Timothy said, six months later, we got the grant, and then we suddenly said, Oh my God, we don't know a thing about puppets. There's no, there were no manuals, no nothing. So, but it was good because, you know, the two of us, you can fail on your own, nobody's looking. So we did a lot of bad mistakes. But we sort of found out. It was something where we, we both said it was something very tabletop, it was very intimate. We could work with just the two of us, we didn't need a crew. And I think that really appealed to us. And if you failed, no one would know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it, 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 at the beginning, I mean, all, all the early puppet films up until, say, Crocodiles were all done. Just the two of us try, trying to carve out an, a, a knowledge of the metier puppets and trying to, to secure that, that realm and do it well. And I remember the first night that um, when we premiered Crocodiles, um, we got a telephone call the next morning saying somebody must have been in the audience that night. And they said, uh, would you work on a pop promo? And we kind of went, oh God, it's come to this. Because we thought that we'd done the best thing in our life and then all that we got out of it was a pop promo, but it was uh, to do Sledgehammer, to work on Sledgehammer. So, I mean, we worked with art and all that. Um, and. It was a good collab. It was a nice collaboration, but I, I don't think it was something that we felt particularly that we wanted to make a, a run at for the rest of our life. I remember on the first day with Peter Gabriel, they, they, they said, "Oh, it's your scene. This is your your guy's scene." And I was putting a train track around his head, and we've never animated in our life in front of another person other than each other. There were all these people standing around. We just looked, and they looked at us. And we, we looked back. I think somebody looked at their watch. We <laughs> suddenly realized we have to get going on this. <laughs> but I think that, that, that what happened was that a, a theater director had seen some of the anim animation work and he said, would you work on a, on a theater design? And we said, we've never done it. He said, don't worry, pretend you're building a puppet set, I'll take care of the rest. And this was Richard Jones, it was the best uh, sort of provocation that we had. So. We worked with a couple, a theater piece, and then a couple of operas with him. And in a sense, it opened up that that the realm of our, our models, which you know are normally like, like this, or these as we see in the so called exactly. So you, you know, a theater set is normally one to twenty-four scale, or sometimes one to fifteen, depending how much you want, how much detail you want to put in it. And um, and then we realized that it wasn't such a big leap now to. We, we, we worked with other people, with uh, uh, costume people, and, and, and then you suddenly see one of your sets peopled by a chorus of 80, like on the Zeppa or something like that, and you suddenly realize it's not so forbidding. And I think that's what, that experience working in the theater then permitted us to think about a live action feature. So that Benny Mento was a film that where we again we said, well, we'll choose our team. We wouldn't let the producer assign us anybody. So we handpicked our whole team, and that's how. And then since that experience really calmed us down, but it was a very forbidding. 
and several Russian animators, Alexeyev, Norstein, Igor Kovalyev. There's an Estonian, Prit Parn. Uh, but you know, we watch live action films too. But we tend to watch sort of, we go back, you know, I think the Criterion boys have opened up that area that we like exploring. So uh, it could be Italian, Japanese, we're there. Obviously pathological, <laughs> um, marginal, um, rarely open to the public. <laughs> the, more, the more that it's against them, I think, the more we prefer. It never occurred to us. I mean, Ron approached us. We in MoMA, so it, we, it would never occur to us in a million years. So, and I, I think we should be dead. <laughs> <laughs>